Hi everyone, this is Fide Master Dennis Monacrucis for ChessLecture.com and today we're going to celebrate or commemorate the very unfortunate passing of a fantastic player who died at a very early age, Bugar Gashimov, a great Azerbaijan player. He died just a few days ago as of this recording at the age of just 27, I believe of a brain tumor. And this was not really unexpected, but still very, very sad. And, and it really not only ended his life at a you know, ridiculously early age, but also really harmed his career tremendously. I mean, that's kind of you know, a little bit beside the point in the big picture. But you know, it, it's still very sad that this player, who was just a, an incredible world-class player, never really got to fully maximize his talent. I mean, he started off as, you know, somewhat of a prodigy. I mean, he was an IM at 12 years old, but already in the year 2000, I believe he was born in 1986, in the year 2000, he already started to suffer from various brain injuries, I think epilepsy. And then by the time he was just a few years older, around 2004, 2005, he had several surgeries to try to remove a brain tumor. And that seemed to take care of it for a while, and then he started to really just climb. I mean, he reached a rating of about 2760, at least a couple of times. I think in uh, 2010, he hit 2759, and in 2012, or the end of 2011, really, he got up to 2761, which is fantastic. And, you know, and again, this is already with some interruptions in his career. And unfortunately, that was the end. After playing in Vicon Zay in 2012, and a couple of Bundesliga games a month later, he was done. He didn't get to play in any more tournaments. He spent the last year and a half of his life in the hospital and passed away early January of 2014. So, you know, really a tragedy in every respect for, for him, for his life, for him, for just, you know, getting to do what he loved to do and, and to do it at the highest possible level. And, of course, for us as chess fans in a very, very um, secondary and diminished way, but for us too. So... Let's take a quick look at least um, at one of his games. Maybe in the future I'll cover some more of them as well. But one kind of cute game I wanted to show today, which also gives us the chance to remember a slightly lesser and somewhat older player, but who also died tragically this past year, uh, Igor Kurnasov, who was a near 2,700 player who uh, died in a car accident this last year. So it's kind of ironic. I mean, that's not why I picked this game out, but it was just, kind of surprising as I was looking at this game to discover that he had also won a nice game on the same side in this variation. So the game we're going to take a look at here was played between Gushimov and Boris Gelfand in the Spanish Team Championship in September of 2009. So let's go ahead and jump in. E4, E5. So Gelfand usually plays either the Knight or uh, nowadays the Sveshnikov a bit too, which he prepared for his match with Anand. But for a good long chunk, he was really uh, playing primarily the Petrov, and so he did in this game. Okay, knight takes e5 is, of course, the absolute main line, but d4 is very important as well. Knight e4. And here the most common move is bishop to d3, when black either plays d5, or can try um, Yakov Muri's uh, fascinating knight to c6, with the idea that after bishop e4, there's d5, and if the bishop retreats, then e4 regains the piece. So it's Another interesting line, it's probably not as, as solid, frankly, as um, the main move with d5, but it's playable too. Anyway, Gushimov played a, another line, which is also reasonable and well-known. D takes e5. Okay, okay, so here, black plays d5. Uh, bishop to c5, I believe, is not a very good move because of queen to, uh, to d5, although maybe it's more complicated than I'm remembering. So it might be something worth checking here. Um, well, so the thought is, okay, bishop f2, and then f5 should lead to very, very murky plays. So I'm not entirely positive what the state of theory is on this. I know I've seen this before, but um, haven't checked it in quite a while. So that, of course, if you want to play d takes e5, you should make sure you uh, refresh your memory on this one. I also wonder if bishop to c5 could be played. And the idea is, of course, if knight f2, then queen d5. Uh, queen e7, bishop g5, but maybe that's no good, maybe just f6. So, tricky stuff, tricky stuff. Also, if knight f2, there's bishop f7 check first, and then queen d5. So, again, maybe bishop f2 check. King e2, maybe castles is okay. Rook f1, 
So very, very complicated. Anyhow, it's, um, I don't know if it's fully sound or not, but it, it's, uh, again, worth looking at if you want to play this way against the Petrov. So not what happened in the game. Black played d5. And here the most common move is bishop to d3, which in fact, Gushimov played against Gelfand the very next year. And uh, that game ended up as a draw. Um, not that, it doesn't mean that knight b to d2, which was played in the game we're going to look at now, is better than bishop to d3. I'm just pointing out that these are alternatives. Anyway, the bishop to d3 game against Gelfand uh, is in the PGN file, so you can take a look at it there. All right, so instead, knight b to d2. And here, knight takes d2. I don't know if it's better, but this was played a couple of times in 2013 by great players, by Ivanchuk and, um, and Andrekin as well. But Gelfin played knight to c5, which is, is and still is a main line, a major line. Knight to b3, knight e6, knight b to d4, knight takes d4, knight takes d4. All right, so now we have a little parting of the way, so we'll take a look at this Kornisov game as well. Uh, Gelfand played bishop to e7 here, but um, in a game Kornisov and Malakotko black played c5. This was played in, in Beal last year in 2013 and led to very, very sharp play uh, about Kornisov. Kornisov was really a fantastic attacking player, you know, very creative, would take lots of risks, and, uh, and we'll see that in this game. So this is right now Kornisov against Malakotko. So black played knight to d7, e6, c takes d4, and now the same move is just to take twice on d7 and then play queen takes d4, regaining the material and having a very small edge thanks to black's isolated d pawn. But instead, Kornisov played e takes f7, which objectively may not be the best, but it's uh, very complicated and it poses a lot of very uh, difficult practical problems to black. So the game went like this, king f7, queen h5 check, King e7, of course, would like to go to g8, but queen takes d5 is mate, so that's a bit of a downer. So king e7, castles, knight f6, rook e1 check, king d6, queen e5 check, king c5, and black is playing well so far. All right, now a, a kind of a, a stylish move, c4, and uh, black did not take emphasis but played king to b6, trying to get out of there, and now... A good move, b4. So he's very happy to have black take. And he's placed rook to b1. Ho hum. So he doesn't care about the rook on e1 because of the discovered checks. And after queen to d6, he just keeps sacrificing. Rook takes rook takes b4. So this is also a great move. Queen takes b4. Uh, queen takes d4 check. Queen c5. And queen to b2. So now here is the, uh, the one chance for black to save himself after all of this uh, with rook to d8. So after this, I think, I'm, it's not clear that white is anything better than just repeating with bishop a4 check. Um, the king can't go to c7 really because of bishop to f4 and the attack is going to rage on. So black should probably go to a6 and then, again, as I said, it's not clear if white is anything better than this repetition. But um, in the game, black did not find rook to d8. Instead, he played what did he play? He played 